Richard and Neil are just on their way now. Here's Neil. Hey, hey how are you going? Hey, Mark. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Hey, Mark. Hey, Richard. Hey, great to have you both here. Uh, and so you're from Swift uh, Payments. Uh, uh, it's a sort of payment uh, standards and uh, a transfer uh, industry body. Uh, yeah, so Swift is a global financial messaging network primarily. That is our historical business. Um, we also work in standardization. We are the governing body for ISO 20022, their financial messaging standard as well. Right, fantastic. We and who's going to be sharing this slide deck and looking that after that? Side of things. That's going to be Richard. So if you do that now, I'll um, uh, leave you to it in a sec. Congratulations on that amazing green couch, by the way. Looks very good. I do you, I know we that would happen just quite by accident, and uh, uh, I was realizing, oh, I've got an instant green screen <laughs> here. If I just move my uh, camera a little bit uh to the to the right um then yeah i've got an instant green screen and we've got the inception you going okay cool okay wonderful i'll jump off and leave you both to it thanks lovely thank you Mark. so um myself and neil we're going to give an overview of the state of standardization uh, as we see it today um, we're also going to discuss what from our perspective is an issue that is becoming more and more urgent, which is that as we're building more and more APIs, um, and many of those are custom APIs, standardization will be harder and harder to implement. So our message really is it's now or never for standardization. Um, and to help that conversation along, we're also going to have a look at what are the areas that we need to look at standardizing? Where can we get additional value for standardized APIs um, and the work that the Swift community is doing in this space? Um, in terms of why Swift is looking at standardization, um, as we were just saying, so Swift is a global financial messaging network. We have more than 11,000 connected entities but we're also the registering body for the ISO 20022 financial messaging standard. So with that reach, with the size of our community and our role in standardization put together, we really think we're in a good place to help both our large community, but also the, um, the rest of the financial community bring about successful standardization. Um, so just as a bit of context, um, I think all of us know that traditionally finance has been quite, excuse me, I'm getting uh, feedback from someone's mic. Could we mute our question? Super, thank you. Um, as, we, as most people at API Days will know, uh, traditionally finance has been quite an isolated uh, industry. So financial institutions have tended to use customized proprietary methods for providing their services. Um, but obviously that does not provide a very good customer service, uh, sorry, customer experience, because if I consume services from several providers, it's going to be costly for me to implement all of their services when they're, uh, when they're not standardized, when all of them are, are customized. Um, and to some extent that openness at some point also started, um, sorry, the lack of openness also started leading to a bit of a st stagnation in terms of innovation and, and the customer experience in finance. Um, that started to change with open banking um, because I, I, I think open banking brought, brought about huge change in the level of customer experiment, experience being provided um, but also the level of openness and innovation going on in the industry because the customer was able to choose the experience that they wanted through a third party. And we can see the effect of this day to day. Um, so just like the, the, the other day, I had a financial background check done just to get a flat and the whole process took me less than a minute. 
all I had to do was fill in my details, give permission to access my bank account, and the platform pulled in the data, did the an analysis in a couple of seconds, and it was over. Now, that obviously would not be viable if the platform provider had to connect to 10 different APIs for each bank. Um, so we've seen really good progress in terms of the level of customer experience being provided, but we're also seeing some growing issues, right? With everyone building APIs for every imaginable use case, and many of, the, of those, actually most of those APIs being custom and proprietary, what we're seeing is there is growing fragmentation in data models, in API specifications, but also in things like usage guidelines, rule books, SLAs. Um, providers use different identity and security models, and all of that adds implementation costs on the client side. Um, so if we take a uh, an example from finance, um, we work a lot with multi-banked, multinational corporates. And um, corporates, those larger corporates tend to have a main bank that they do, do most of their trans transactions with, but they also use other banks for different regions, maybe for different business areas. So a pattern that we see very often is um, a APIs are not as popular as they could be um, in terms of doing the doing the service provision between the corporate and their banks. But I think more dangerously, we also see that it creates a bit of an API, so, sorry, it creates a bit of an winner take all dynamic in APIs. Um, because if a corporate um, needs to prioritize who they're going to spend money on for the implementation, they will go to the biggest bank, they will go to the one that they do most business with, and the long tail will get left behind. So in the long run, what you will see is there will be a lack of competition because of that, and a drop in overall customer experience as well. Um, so we really need to address those issues now um, the Swift community is working on all these varied aspects of standardization. So we're going, obviously doing standardized data models and uh, standardized API specifications, but also looking at, can we agree on shared identity and security models and the management side? So rule books, SLAs, things like that. Now, just to remind ourselves why, why we think standardization is so important, um, we think that the primary driver of standardization is the need to reduce cost to implement. If we reduce cost to implement, we will be able to increase reach because we'll be, uh, clients will be able to consume more services. If we increase reach and if we uh, get more service consumption, then we will get the promise the, of APIs, um, which is that we can use building blocks created by others in an easy to implement way. We can embed those building blocks in our processes, in our products, and we can focus on what makes us unique. We can focus on our strengths and we're able to innovate in our own niche rather than having to build the basic infrastructure ourselves. So we've touched on this a bit. So what do we need to look um, at when standardizing? Usually when we talk about standardization in APIs, people uh, think about the data model, right? But there's areas surrounding that that are really important to create that smooth, frictionless experience for a client implementing the service. So for example, it's important to think about um, the business definitions and business models. As an example, um, you might have a data element in the data model, um, which is a Boolean flag 
that shows whether a particular bank account can receive funds. Now, the definition of a bank account that can receive funds will vary per jurisdiction. So if you're creating a global standard, you need to think about, okay, how do I put some structure around this complexity? So you might take the different regions and group them together into categories and then use those categories as a data element in the schema itself. But you need some way to handle that complexity so that the service providers globally act in a predictable way to the client. So um, standardizing the business model is all about how do we interpret the data model itself. Um, also to, to add that extra assurance and predictability to the client, we need some management around it. So um, how, what kind of usage guidelines do we have? Can we agree on shared SLA so that as a client, I don't have to worry, worry about variation in those between my different service providers? Also, obviously, the technical side, so identity and security, um, it's pretty easy to implement good API security these days. There's very good uh, common standards for that, but it's all about getting together as a community and agreeing on specific ways of doing it per use case so that again if i'm a client and i want to consume the service from three to four different providers i can do that without you know the cost of extra implementation and sometimes it's also uh, very useful to have shared gateways so if a service is running uh, if, if we have a specific shared gateway uh, connecting the service providers and the clients we can start using centralized services like uh, payload validation, for example, to add an additional level of, of assurance to the client that the whole ecosystem is acting in a predictable way. Um, next, Neil is going to be talking about the different areas that Swift is looking at uh, in collaboration with our community, the work we're doing, but also the risks that we carry by not paying enough attention to those areas in a standardization effort. Um, overall, the SWIFT process for standardization, it all starts with the ISO 20022 library. Off the back of that, we create open API specifications, which as we just heard from Alexa, in a, in a very similar way, they form the basis of everything that follows. So the, the OAS um, is there for the sandbox, the OAS is published as documentation on the developer portal, but off the OAS, we also generate SDKs for implementation of the client side and server stubs for implementation of the provider side. Um, and in addition to that, we also work in a collaborative way with the community to uh, agree on a way of managing the APIs of uh, versioning, uh, how the lifecycle works, um, but also creating SLAs and then benchmarking uh, providers against each other so that again, we can provide a better experience for the clients and more assurance and more predictability in a many-to-many -many environment. Um, but I'll hand over to Neil now and he will tell you about it all in more detail. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, so yeah, let's take a look at some of the risks of not standardizing and, and what we do in our community to, to mitigate that risk and, and solve some of the problems. So if we start with, um, with the, the, the role of uh, business and data models in standardization. So without a standardized data and business model, there's additional cost for your API consumers, for your clients. And providing APIs effectively speak a different language that is going to leave consumers with duplicated effort where they're effectively re-implementing uh, different versions from different providers, but it's essentially it's still the same API. Um, not standardizing on your data models might make you an outlier, so are you worth the effort? Will you reach your customers if your uh, API requires extra customization? And the fact that models and implementation differ means that onboarding becomes a much heavier process. It's not, it's not a straightforward sign-up or, or an API sign-up. 
Uh, there's likely to be a need for consumers to evaluate and translate your data models. Uh, and there's going to be more testing as part of that onboarding process. And different data models are going to make it difficult for interoperability. They make it difficult to combine APIs to solve problems or to add new capabilities, at least not without additional cost in mapping and, and translation. And all of these combined uh, you know, lead to a decreased value proposition for your APIs. So how do we tackle these issues? Um, so as, as we said, we use uh, data models derived from the ISO 20022 standard. That gives us that common language across all the APIs. And this ISO standard provides a rich set of definitions for accounts, beneficiaries, debtors, payments, and many other uh, financial entities. And this reduces the risk of misunderstanding across APIs, reduces the risk of increased cost that might come from custom implementations. Um, it helps to improve interoperability, especially across APIs that all use the same base for the data models. Uh, we collaborate with our community and our members on standardized API specifications. So using that ISO model as a base, uh, we create open API specifications to standardize and communicate the API contracts. And this is all done through co-creation groups. So where we meet regularly with, with a group of customers to define the requirements review progress until the publication of the specification. And we publish and evolve API design guidelines for consistent specifications, and also standard ways to handle some of the, the technical aspects of the, of the design, such as um, errors and, and pagination. So again, we want to avoid this repetition, this uh, enforcing on the customers lots of different models for some of these technical aspects. And today we've applied this in various banking use cases and, and we're working on some securities. Um, so we have some already published. There's a, a buy now, pay later API specification and a corporate to bank account balance API specification. And I think it'd be interesting to take a, a closer look at, at that one right now. So um, why is this API valuable? So corporate treasury functions uh, rely on up-to-date information on their account balances for cash management. Not only the, the current balance, but the available cash and the cash that's due to be received. And the, the issue that they face really is in, in sort of timely access to this balance data. Uh, quite often it's manual processes or batch processes that reduce an intraday visibility of, of the cash that they have available. So the solution that the, the, the community came up with is an API that enables real-time access to uh, on-demand access to account balances and it's standardized for easy adoption. If you think about um, corporate treasury management, it's probably uh, through a vendor's ERP or treasury management systems. So the standardization of the data model helps with scalability. So it avoids um, difficulties where we have many to many relationships, whether that's corporates uh, with, with many bank accounts, so connecting to many banks, or whether we have a vendor trying to cater for many corporates to, to many banks. Our um, standardized data model also eases integration. So again, we can we can look to that improved forecasting and, and cash management. Standardized API access also enables things like uh, automation from, from the platforms. So we can start to reduce operational costs. And finally, the, the thing that you can't get from batch processes, we can have some flexibility from the API. So we can um, query you know, a, a single account or we can add in extra features such as um, transaction summaries. So let's go beyond uh, modeling and specification and, and think about identity and security and, and connectivity. So we know the overall risk here is, is one of uh, increased cost and time and spend on things that could and should be easier. It should be standard for everyone. Um, establishing bilateral connections with counterparties doesn't scale well due to repeated costs of setting up, testing, and maintaining connections. Um, without standardization and identity and security, scalability is further impacted, and so is the onboarding process. So again, clients have got these repeated costs for repeating onboarding to the different identity and security schemes. And customer reach is going to be impacted if customers have to navigate through yet another combination of these identity and security schemes. Uh, from my own experience, I've seen customers fail to complete an onboarding process 
because of identity and security that differed from the standard. So in the, the API specification in that instance, it met the standard. The actual onboarding process was, was a little bit different, it wasn't what customers expected. And it became much more of a, a manual back and forth to establish identity and to get the security set up. And what we saw going through that process um, was customers tended to drop off. And the, the, the disadvantage there was that we, um, we, we, we could have followed a standardized process for that. Um, establishing different identities with different frameworks, with different counterparties, also leads to more complex architectures for consumers to set up and maintain. Um, so let's uh, take a look, what are the solutions to this? How do we tend to tackle these risks? Um, for identity and security, the Swift community is able to leverage some of the, the valuable assets that we already have in, in messaging. Um, for identity, they can benefit from existing identity and access management, uh, covering more than 11,000 you're covering our 11,000 community members. And this brings some standardization to identity. Uh, from a security perspective, the SWIFT network itself is secured, secured with the SWIFT public key infrastructure. So again, everyone is the same standardized security model. And we go a stage further. So we try and ease the onboarding and connectivity and the operation of APIs through uh, client SDKs, uh, provider, server stubs. These are all derived from those um, standardized data models and API specifications. And we enable it through shared API gateways on the Swift network. So standardized access points for the standardized APIs. We put all these together, then the SDKs, the shared API gateways, standardized models and specifications. It allows us to start providing some additional services so we can provide things like payload validation across the APIs and that ISO 20022 business model. Um, so we're reducing the complexity and the friction in both the technical side and in the business side. And the third area we'd like to look at is um, API management. And, and how do we bring standardization into this topic? So it means um, you know, we're thinking about that process of taking an idea through, uh, through Go Live and beyond. How do we support that with standard tools and processes? Uh, it means thinking about service levels, maintenance, versioning cycles, and, and we have to do so in that collaborative environment to form the standard. Uh, not working to SLAs and market practices increases the risk of reduced quality in the ecosystem. And failing to consider how they're managed uh, can increase the cost of developing and, and operating those APIs. Uh, standardizing the approach uh, means that, you know, all the participants, the participants have the same expectation. Uh, technical assurance of providers is critical too, so not having these in place runs the risk of providers not adhering to standards. Um, and you know we're, we're looking not looking for different processes again around uh, the onboarding process because we, we want to avoid this repetition of, of cost and effort. So what do we do to solve these issues? Um, members collaborate to agree on SLAs and rule books for operation of APIs. Uh, between providers and consumers. With this in place, uh, service levels can be tracked and published to promote a self-governing system. Um, are the slides frozen, Rich? Okay, thank you. My bad. That's okay. Uh, we collaborate, uh, invest in you know, provider and partner assurance, so making sure they meet all of the agreed standards from, from modeling to implementation. So in doing so, that helps us maintain the high quality of the APIs also helps them reduce the risk of, uh, of, of um, and the impact in customer reach. And we try to align delivery cycles and versioning strategies so that consumers and providers don't have this uh, unexpected disruption so they can deliver without that. Um, the Swift developer portal becomes a shared uh, place for standardized specifications to communicate versioning and to ease consumption with resources around the, the SDKs and the, the onboarding process. We're able to use uh, you know, our insights and analytics to help with the transparency and the performance of the overall process. Neil and Richard, that's fantastic. Do you want to uh, do a quick wrap up? We've got a question from the audience. Shall I jump in and ask that now, actually? Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Would you like, a, like me to stop sharing the slides now? No, uh, it's great to have them up uh, here because we're, unfortunately we're not gonna get to them. There was 
uh, a really great way of walking us through of the various concerns with standards. And it's great, you know, and it is an important time for standards because, as you say, the complexity, I mean, you can see from the group of um, attendees here and the, and the presentations, this is a sector that's going to just take off over the next year. So if we don't have the standards in place, it's a lot of the challenges that you've um, outlined, especially Neil, in um, the, this second part of the presentation, they're going to be they're going to be huge business blockers. You know, so so this is really great stuff. Um, uh, if as we're talking, maybe if there's any more slides to cycle through, maybe work through those. The question from Jens was, how do you standardize the data model? Do you implement a strict canonical model through all of the API types, for example, advanced-based, transactional, that sort of stuff? I know that's a big question to put on you, but it's about standardizing the data model as a part. So I think what you've been talking about standardizing the APIs, and I think maybe Jens is getting that. What about the underlying data model? Do you standardize that as well? Or yes, absolutely. So um, the way we, so as I said before, we are also active in messaging, right? And we are not trying to create um, a situation where our APIs are not compatible with the messaging side, because the Swift messaging platform is still very popular as well. Right, so we really start with the ISO 20022 data model and both the APIs and the messaging hang uh, off of that one single canonical data model. Right, okay, great. Richard, are you able to um, forward the slides to your contact details so people can follow up? Absolutely. Um, thanks, my apologies for having to cut you both off there. There's a lot here. The, um, the other thing that makes me think about is just like, you know, like um, what you're showing shows that there's the need also for us to be able to measure the differences. Like your slides, Neil, showed what are the, some of the challenges without standards and then how your community is addressing those. And it'd be great to see um, like a bank that's not using standards and a bank that's using standards and then seeing, you know, what the difference for onboarding time is for their reach for the client implementation costs so that you're able to do, we've got an evidence base that we're building that demonstrates the business value of standards as well. So I'm sure that'll be part of the work that comes out um, in the future. There's, so the, what's the, oh, developer.swift.com. There we go. Indeed, developer.swift.com. You will find Neil's example of community APIs that we have already published there. And that is also the way to get in touch with us or get in touch with myself or Neil on, on LinkedIn. Wonderful. Thank you both for, uh, for this. If you could stop sharing the screen now um, and uh, I'll walk you both off the stage as we invite Yinzu, Yinzu and Joseph Joyce um, on.